Sekiro is the latest entry in From Software's never-ending quest to bring soul-crushing pain, suffering, and tears to the gaming community. While the title mentions dying only twice, you will most likely reach your untimely demise hundreds of times attempting to complete this gauntlet of a game. Sekiro will kick you in the balls, and you'll smile up it and tell the game you like it. All humor aside, the purpose of this video is to showcase an in-depth analysis of the combat's overall strengths and weaknesses. I will be spoiling large portions of Sekiro, so if you haven't played it yet, I would recommend turning off this video. Although if you're watching this video, you've probably already played it anyway. If you want a bare bones recommendation about the entire game to some random guy on YouTube, I would say the game isn't for everyone, but it's definitely worth playing if you've enjoyed past From Software games or a masochist looking for your next fix. With all that out of the way, let's dive in. At its core, Sekiro is a Soulsborne game. It has many similarities to its predecessors, the SS Last type healing system, a series of checkpoints similar to the bonfires, fast traveling between bonfires, a challenging but fair combat system, etc. However, with this new title comes some sharp differences. The combat has been entirely reworked, the movement is far faster and more open to the player, there is no stamina bar, your character now has only two stats, and there is a strong reliance on stealth related mechanics. I came into Sekiro knowing nothing about the game. I had played all of the other previous Soulsborne titles excluding Demon Souls multiple times, and expected to have an easier time because of it. But let me say, it was a surprise, and a pleasure, when I got my ass handed to me over and over again, god damn this game! The best change from software made in Sekiro is the combat system. Any Soulsborne veteran understands that a player must memorize the attack patterns of most enemies found throughout the game. However, Sekiro takes it a step further by having the player heavily rely on parrying or deflecting attacks. Now the player must also know the parry windows of every single attack, or at least get a general sense of where these windows are. This provides a unique spin to the formula from software has been using up until this point. In the Souls series, the combat was significantly slower, you continuously dodged or blocked a foe's attacks, learned the moveset, and slowly discovered when it was safe to launch a counterattack, getting in hits until you finally depleted the enemy's health bar. This was further slowed down by having a limited number of actions through a stamina bar. Bloodborne's combat is a middle ground between the two. It is far faster paced and has some reliance on parrying, however it still has a stamina bar linear actions and the same general pattern of getting in a few hits and backing off again. You see that trash can in the corner over there? That's where all the knowledge you've gained over the past 5 games belongs. In Sekiro, the hit and run strategy no longer works. Chipping away at an enemy's health tends to be quite ineffective and only serves as a way of lowering posture regeneration, while maxing out an enemy's posture essentially leads to an insta-kill. Based off of that statement alone, it's obvious how effective raising a foe's posture is. The ideal goal was to continually apply pressure to an enemy, getting in minor vitality damage so their posture recovers at a slower rate, while at the same time raising their posture constantly. With all that being said, the player also has a posture bar that is used similarly to stamina in past games. If the player's bar fills up entirely, they will be stunned for a couple seconds, allowing a foe to inflict damage. This serves as a risk averse reward kind of mechanic. No matter how high your posture is, it doesn't have any impact on your abilities, and the bar will not break if an attack is deflected. This means you can keep attacking and deflecting, or you can choose to back off and recover some of your posture. The downside is, the enemy is also recovering posture if you choose to back off. If the player decides to keep fighting, they can gain the reward of inflicting more posture damage, but run the risk of having their own posture broken if they make a mistake. This means if you're not comfortable with a fight yet, your posture bar will most likely limit your actions and effectively act like a stamina bar. I believe this mechanic works quite well. All enemies adhere to the exact same rules as you. This means if you obtain a strong understanding of an enemy's moveset, you can practically ignore your own posture bar and constantly be on the offensive. This rewards the player for their tenacity and shows them just how far they have advanced in the game. It's a fantastic feeling that the game excels at giving the player. It's pretty apparent the goal of the system was to make the player feel like Batman. Wait, wait, what? Hold on. I didn't even play this game, and I know that's not true. Um, uh, shit. What's his name again? Cripple Samurai? You know what? Fuck it, yeah. Cripple Samurai. Mm-hmm, great name. Opponents are now a lot faster and have stronger tracking on attacks. The combat is designed to block an enemy's offense rather than dodge it. This is further emphasized by the posture mechanic, which is the best way to defeat foes. Battling a significant adversary gives off the feeling of an epic one-on-one -on -one duel, while lesser foes make you feel akin to a master fighting an amateur. The former leaves the player feeling satisfied and respectful towards the opposition, while the latter creates a high of overwhelming power as you murder everything in sight. It's challenging to walk the line between these two opposites, but Sekiro manages to pull it off quite well. You can tell a large amount of care went into developing this system. The unblockable attacks allow the game to mix up combat so it isn't just a monotonous back and forth of deflecting and attacking with the occasional dodge woven in. The combat feels exceptionally satisfying and continues the moniker of hard but fair that has been adopted from past titles to an even greater degree. I would also argue the combat is one of if not the best mechanics Sekiro has going for it. 
With all that praise, I can't help but acknowledge two glaring issues with the combat. Sekiro is filled with some of the most challenging bosses in game I've ever played, yet none of them compare to the colossal beast that is the camera. This force of nature has the uncanny ability to block your entire field of view while its minions kill poor purple samurai. The fact that it can't even be bothered to kill you itself shows new levels of mockery in these games. Often it is further exasperated as the player is pushed continuously back when deflecting enemy attacks. This makes it extremely challenging, if not downright impossible, to react to an enemy's offense in tightly packed spaces. The issue is made even worse if multiple enemies are attacking, leading to the player possibly getting stuck between them and ultimately dying. This feels extremely frustrating in a game where death is supposed to be the player's fault, especially if it causes them to lose a large amount of progress to circumstances that were outside of their control. I know people need this weird concept called proof nowadays, so here's an example of an encounter where the camera is an issue. The Guardian 8 fight is a 2 on 1 beatdown where not only is this thing flinging feces at you, but makes a hot tag to the camera almost constantly. If the boss manages to yeet you into a nearby wall, the camera completely collapses and gives you no information as to what the boss is doing. From Software must have realized this issue, as usually the ape will never attack after performing this grab. However, if you are close enough to the boss, it will strike, essentially ending the fight. This is in no way fair to the player and can lead to extreme amounts of frustration. Needless to say, there are a plethora of encounters where the camera becomes another obstacle to the player in case this one wasn't good enough for you. The other main issue with Sekiro's combat is with the medicine term Duel. The system works best whenever you are fighting a powerful opponent in a one-on-one -on -one battle. If another enemy of equal or greater challenge is added to the mix, the game shits the bed. And I mean really shits the bed. Like the shit is piling up higher than the Guardian 8 battle. I would like to be clear and say multiple weaker enemies work fine, and this is only applied to the stronger enemies found throughout the game. This issue has always been prevalent throughout Soulsborne games, but Sekiro is by far the worst offender. This is in large part due to the posture mechanic added to the game. In past games, foes didn't automatically block most of your attacks and only need their health bar to reach zero. Every single hit you landed on an enemy was taking you one step closer to defeating that opponent. In Sekiro, getting vitality damage done is a luxury, and posture is the definitive method of defeating an opponent. The problem is, if you aren't attacking an opponent and they aren't attacking you, that posture damage is recovering. You are losing the progress you've made towards defeating that opponent rather than it being stagnant. With multiple enemies, it becomes incredibly challenging to halt this recovery or even inflict damage without taking some some type of damage in return. This is due to the higher amount of tracking enemies are given, as well as only being able to block from one direction. The player can attempt to deflect the enemy's attacks, however they will most likely be unable to entirely deflect multiple enemy onslaughts, leading to high amounts of posture damage and forcing them to retreat. This isn't even considering being attacked from various angles where deflecting is no longer possible. Another option is carefully dodging an enemy's attacks. The problem here is, you are making no progress towards raising their posture. Even if you do manage to get a few hits in, the other enemy is likely to distract you until the original target recovers some posture. The combat in Sekiro is supposed to be challenging, but fair to the player. When you take damage, it is supposed to be your fault. These encounters aren't impossible by any means, but oftentimes lead to the player taking damage so they can inflict some kind of damage in return. In a game where healing is meant to be more of a limit to how many mistakes you can make, I am not comfortable with these encounters leading to what feels like unavoidable damage. The combat simply isn't built for this style of battle. There's a reason every single boss and mini boss besides one has only one significant enemy per battle, and even then that battle it was poorly designed and often cheesed. Up until this point, I've been mainly focusing on the core aspects of combat. I have been ignoring some key components such as stealth, a shinobi prosthetic, combat arts, and ninjutsu. I left these out of the initial discussion because I wanted to address the fundamentals of combat first. I think they were substantial enough to necessitate their own discussion. I'm going to address each of these mechanics now and talk about how they factor into the overall combat of the game. I mentioned stealth first, so let's start out there. Sekiro begins with Cripple Samurai having access to no weapon and very little health. This is designed to teach the player immediately that stealth will be an essential aspect of this game and serves as a strong introduction to the mechanic. 
Enemies will have a yellow triangle above their head that will slowly build up if they suspect you are near. Eventually, the triangle will fill up, informing the player that the enemy is aware of their presence and they will begin to search for you actively. If the enemy discovers you, the triangle will turn red and they will notify other nearby enemies of your location. Once enemies lose sight of you, they will eventually revert back to the yellow alert status and from there forget you ever existed. The game also assists you in keeping track of where a foe is by displaying a yellow or red arrow to their location if they are off screen and alerted to your presence. An argument I often see is the stealth system gives the player a higher degree of choice, however I would argue the exact opposite and say Sekiro is far more constraining in its combat system. In Dark Souls and Bloodborne, the player was free to develop their character however they wished. You could be a towering knight with a massive overcompensating greatsword, a mage apprehensive of nearby enemies, or a slippery rogue whose favorite pastime was watching your attacks pass right through them. The point is, the player had access to multiple different playstyles through a variety of stats and weapons. In Sekiro, you have two options, either blitz the enemy with your sword or stealthily kill them all, or neither, I don't know, I'm not your parent. Fuck you. A third option could be a mixture of the two. A fourth option could be you keeping your eyes glued to the screen while that guy from five years ago that your mom always said was a personal friend but you always bring back presents for her on Valentine's Day and goes upstairs to have a mutual workout session with her. The stealth mechanic grants the player the freedom to choose how they are going to kill an enemy, but only within that mechanic. There are four types of stealth death blows in the game. The most common one is merely sneaking up behind an unaware enemy. The others include jumping on them from above, hanging off a ledge below them, and killing them from behind a wall they are passing by. These methods would be fine if there were interesting ways to achieve the proper position to get the kill. Basically, it's all about the journey, and less about the goal. Except the journey is lacking just as much a variety as the four goals. Usually, the answer to sneaking up behind a foe is looking for the closest grapple point or just casually walking up from behind. This gets boring and repetitive very quickly. However, stealth is very necessary to combat. Areas in Sekiro tend to be extremely open with a large degree of enemies littered throughout. Fighting all of these foes at once ranges from quite challenging to downright brutal because the core aspects of combat are geared towards duels. Stealth allows the player to even the odds, making the numbers far more manageable. You may argue that this answers the criticism about multiple enemies I mentioned earlier, but the problem is stealth doesn't address the issue directly. It feels more like a band-aid over a wound that's bleeding profusely. To illustrate my point, an example is the straw hat monks found in the latter half of Senpao Temple. These enemies are somewhat challenging and are placed in a way where you cannot sneak up on them. Fighting both at once is quite tricky and always felt unfair because of the game's focus on single style combat. Realistically, you can use stealth to cheese this encounter through cheap tactics, but this never sits well with me. It's the equivalent of luring multiple powerful enemies to the end of their path and getting in cheap shots to win. The player isn't honing their skills or learning how to overcome this obstacle, and it provides very little of that sense of accomplishment or proper fair and just challenge that makes these games so satisfying. At the same time, I don't blame people for doing this when the game gives you a system that doesn't allow the player to handle this encounter effectively. While stealth is a fundamental aspect of Sekiro, overall, I would say it works to the game's detriment. Standard enemy encounters can be trivialized due to how easy the stealth system is to abuse. I know what you're thinking. First I say the game is too hard, and now I'm arguing the game is too easy. Listen, don't blame the narrator with the disgusting voice. Blame the poor, starving scriptwriter? What? Wait a minute. Clearly giving them a rag to sleep on and a diet of breadcrumbs and water is too much. I'll have to break out the- Enemies in Sekiro seem to have the sight capabilities of my 95 year old grandmother and the attention span of a goldfish. This is a game about control shattering difficulty that I can make suicide jokes about and I can pull off bullshit like this. This issue was further exasperated by possessing the ability to merely duck behind some wall for 30 seconds and having the enemy go about their merry way. I guess his two friends must have gotten really tired on the job or are really good at playing possum. Even many mini bosses can be demoted to slightly stronger standard enemies by performing a stealth death blow on them. Better practice would be if adversaries always maintained a yellow triangle in the event it ever went red unless you reset the area. This would still have the enemies on high alert to your presence, making it harder to abuse the system. Also, increasing a foe's ability to discover you would at least in my opinion, further enhance the experience. I'll admit this isn't a perfect fix, but it's definitely a step in the right direction and entirely possible to implement. Now that we're past stealth, let's move on to another mechanic of combat, the Shinobi Prosthetic. During my first playthrough of Sekiro, I hardly used the prosthetic. I would occasionally utilize it to give me some edge in combat like the firecracker against beast type enemies. I attempted to use the prosthetic tools more in subsequent playthroughs, but still found myself having to go out of my way to use them. My issue was, nothing worked better than the attack deflecting combination that the game beat into me so thoroughly, I made a video critiquing it. I believe the problem is the best uses for the majority of these tools is against standard encounters. However, the stealth system in combination with the core aspects of combat does not properly incentivize the use of these tools. In the very beginning, 
Cripple Samurai has access to no weapon. From Software introduces stealth before combat to ensure the player understands how vital this mechanic will be. The first gadget any player will find is the shuriken, right after the second Buddha statue found in the game. This wouldn't be a huge issue if the spinning star actually felt useful. The majority of the enemies you encounter in the beginning will simply block the attack, or it will inflict so little damage it feels insignificant. Immediately the tools feel more like collectibles rather than an essential aspect of combat. This mentality is further reinforced by the other tools you can acquire at the beginning of the game. The loaded axe is demonstrated to be useful against shield type enemies, and the flame vent stuns red eyed enemies. These types of adversaries are found rarely throughout the game, detracting from the tools use. In terms of regular combat, these tools aren't that great either. The axe is far too slow for the amount of damage it inflicts in the beginning, and the majority of enemies die so quickly, burning them is ineffective. I'll concede that the tools definitely have their advantages. Outside of what has already been mentioned, the shuriken is useful against enemies that go airborne. The Sabi Maru automatically stuns and poisons whatever these creatures in the Fountainhead Palace are, and the Firecracker stuns beast-type enemies. All of the prosthetics either don't have a niche use, or that use is utilized so infrequently, I wonder why they even bothered. Outside of distinct advantages, the tools can be used to assist cripple samurai in general combat and some boss encounters. The devices provide the player with a variety of ways to handle an enemy. It's similar to stealth in that it seems to allow a lot more choice in combat, but the difference is the options provided don't feel nearly as limiting. There are some creative things you can do with the gadgets that reward the player for experimenting with what's given to them. Some examples are using the Sabimaru on the Snake Eye mini bosses and using the Spear in the Headless Ape fight to pull out the centipede for a large amount of damage. Something I haven't mentioned yet is the upgrade tree available to the tools. Every single gizmo has multiple versions of itself that can be used independently of the others. Basically, whenever you upgrade a gadget, the older versions are still available to be used. This is far better than having the upgraded version replace everything that came before it because every enhancement can have a unique purpose or advantage in combat. At least that's what I would say if From Software actually did that. Many of the better versions of these tools only do more damage or have minor status effects tagged on that hardly ever trigger. An example is the shuriken. Every single enhancement only serves to increase the damage the device inflicts, or the difference has very little impact on combat. There is no unique feature, and every new version eliminates the need for any past upgrade. However, this criticism isn't all-inclusive. The loaded spear and umbrella have multiple upgrades that would be utilized over newer versions. The spear has a cleave version that attacks in a wide arc, making it useful against numerous enemies, and different versions of the umbrella block various status effects. My final piece of criticism is how enhancements are reliant on upgrading other tools first. The biggest issue is, if you don't find a specific tool in Ashida, it can completely block all avenues to further upgrades. During my first playthrough, I didn't find the Sabi Maru until much later in the game, which blocked my access to an entire half of the tree. This served to further isolate me from using any tools because I couldn't upgrade them. A better system would be having the tools all be independent of one another. You could gate the progress by only giving players access to the materials needed to enhance them later in the game. In fact, Sekiro already employs this tactic, and I wonder why they chose a different system. Overall, I feel the prosthetic is a side feature that is overshadowed by attacking and deflecting because its uses are too niche and not well enough integrated into combat. Ladies and gentlemen, it looks like I'm having a little deja vu today because I never used combat arts or ninjutsu during my first playthrough. Although, I did use them in subsequent playthroughs, so no pitchforks please. I'll begin with talking about combat arts. Outside of Ichimoji and Haima, I feel as if the majority of these arts are relatively useless. None of them compare to either of these in terms of damage, and most of them are objectively bad. They do minuscule damage and often leave Cripple Samurai susceptible to counterattacks. I've been told you're the worst swordsman on the block, and from what I've seen, they're damn right. I think it's time to test something out. You know what? They said it wouldn't work, but it's gonna work against you. Nightjar! I'm not even disappointed. Why did I even think this would work? Maybe it has something to do with me announcing it beforehand? <laughs> nah, this thing sucks. Never mind. Shadow Rush and other skills like it also have their use, but I feel their placement at the end of skill trees hurts their accessibility. There are just too many other necessary skills to be prioritized over Shadow Rush and other combat arts placed at the end of trees. Seriously, the entirety of the Mushun arts might as well not exist for how much they cost to obtain. This is especially true for a first playthrough where a player will be losing a large amount of their skill to deaths. Even when I played through the game on a whole new cycle where I hardly died, I never had enough skill points to unlock these arts. The only possible way I see anyone unlocking these abilities is through grinding at the end of the game. This is pointless because there isn't anything substantial to use these arts on. The grinding isn't entertaining either, and is only made worse by how much skill it takes to get a skill point at the end of the game. 
My final problem with combat arts is you can only equip one at a time. Sure, you can pause a fight and change them on the fly, but being able to cycle through to another right in the middle of combat would bring a considerable amount of variety to a game sorely lacking it. While I'm on the subject of these swanky abilities, I might as well discuss the trees as a whole. The enhancements you can unlock from various skill trees range from bold and brash to belongs in the trash. Abilities like Breath of Life Light, Shinobi Eyes, Ascending Carp, and the different Emma Medicines are so useful, I couldn't imagine playing the game without them. Then there are the skills you should have started the game with. These include Mikuri Counter, the Grappling Hook Attack, Run and Slide, and Mid-Air Deflection. I just defeated a giant ape that has such tenacity, it picked up its severed head for a round 2, and my reward is now being able to slide while running? Excuse me while I slide right off the edge of this cliff. It's a shame that these skills couldn't have been replaced with something more useful as they feel like a lazy way to make the trees appear more fleshed out. Many of the remaining so-called abilities have such little impact on gameplay, I feel bad spending any points on them. Stealth is already a joke and you're telling me I can make it easier? Damn, sign me up. Ninjutsu is the biggest letdown since my dad said he was leaving only for him to return with milk promptly within the hour. If the shinobi prosthetic is too limiting in its use, then ninjutsu might as well not even exist in comparison. Let's analyze each ability individually. Blood Smoke lets Cripple Samurai use the powers of blood magic, which has never been known to have any ramifications to blind foes, allowing a stealth death blow to be done. In reality, this skill is just a more expensive version of the Divine Abduction Shinobi tool. I've gone to great lengths highlighting how broken stealth is, and now you can utilize it whenever you get a death blow from behind? I think you can piece together why this seems so unnecessary. Puppeteer lets you turn the game into a coliseum where you eat popcorn while betting on which sorry soul caught dancing for your amusement is going to win. This is probably the most useful skill as it helps you deal with challenging encounters packed with many enemies. However, these confrontations aren't engaged in often enough to merit a significant amount of use, although I will admit it is entertaining to watch stronger enemies tear into weaker foes. The last ninjutsu is Bestowal. It imbues Cripple Samurai Sword with magic similar to the Mortal Blade, granting more damage and reach on attacks. Bestowal's problem is, it costs far too many spirit emblems and doesn't last long enough to justify using. I would also argue the best time to use this ninjutsu would be against bosses or mini bosses, except you can't because there aren't any other enemies to death blow. Even if there are adds, the player should focus on defeating them all before engaging in the fight, meaning Bestowal can only be used from the very beginning or not at all, making it fairly useless. I know I've appeared negative towards combat, but I really do believe it is the best part of the game, and when it shines, it's a star. The posture-based deflecting dueling system is fantastic, and when played to its strengths, it leaves a strong feeling of satisfaction at the end of every encounter. However, stealth is far too simple, allowing the player to run over challenging encounters through cheese tactics rather than learning the game. I fully support allowing players to play however they please, and I don't think people who do this should be ashamed. With that being said, this style of play doesn't improve players' overall skill and takes away the feeling of satisfaction that comes whenever overcoming a major obstacle. You also cannot use stealth during any boss encounter and are forced to learn the patterns of the fight to advance the game. Unless you decide to cheese with the firecrackers because for some unfathomable reason half the game is weak to this thing. The exception to this is multiple enemy based encounters where I feel the player is often given little choice but to use these tactics. All other aspects of combat such as combat arts, ninjutsu, or shinobi tools have very similar issues in that they aren't developed enough or the core of battle is too effective to merit using them consistently. I wanted to personally thank you for watching the video all the way to the end. Whether you vehemently disagree or are a sycophantic admirer, I would love if you left a comment with your opinion on what I've outlined in this video. It would mean a lot to me. I will be making another video of similar length about all the remaining aspects of Sekiro. However, this will not be a channel about Sekiro. I plan on making videos similar to this one on many other games in a wide variety of different genres. If that's something that interests you, consider subscribing. Or don't. I'm not your parent. Regardless, thank you for watching, and I hope to see you next time.